I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. How do human beings find their way around their planet? How do they know what lies beyond the sea, or where a road leads? Did Marco Polo have an atlas to show him the route to China? Did the Romans record the borders of their empire on maps? For thousands of years, unknown, distant lands guarded their secrets, and yet they were described in travel books and imaginative maps. The face of the world has fascinated people in every age and culture. The true picture of the Earth, the Blue Planet, has fascinated the peoples of every age and culture. But it is thousands of years before people can work out the shape, measure the size, and reveal the secrets of their world. What lies beyond the mountains? Where does this ravine lead to? What sea does this river flow into? Each culture seeks answers to questions like these and forms its own picture of the world, influenced by myths and fantasies created by curiosity and scientific research. The ancient philosophers had their picture of the world, as did people living in the Middle Ages. Medieval scholars had long since begun to put together an accurate picture of the Earth, the Earth was a sphere, not flat. But at the equator, the heat was so great because the Earth was so close to the sun that everything there was in danger of evaporating, burning up or melting. Could this barrier be overcome? And what did it look like on the other side? Didn't everything there turn to ice, freeze solid? Ideas like this still worried the crews of the great explorers. Uncertainty was rife. In the Middle Ages, these questions couldn't be answered, but they seemed burningly relevant, like the question of whether there were human beings living on the other side of the earth. If so, would their legs stick up into our faces, or would they fall off the surface of the earth? Frequently asked questions. Even the ancient philosophers had said that such speculations were nonsensical. Nonetheless, they wouldn't go away and terrified people before explorers of the modern age could report on how things really were in the southern hemisphere. But there aren't any boiling seas, the explorers report back. Their ships do not come under attack by sea monsters and their sails do not melt in the heat of the sun. And where the sun sinks in the west, there is life too. People don't fall off the face of the earth. Instead, the intrepid travelers quickly put together a pretty accurate picture of the world. Indeed, they capture the earth on paper as a sphere. Cartographers draw the world and skillful craftsmen construct the globe. Im Jahr der Entdeckung Amerikas, dem Jahr 1492, schuf Martin In the year America was discovered, in 1492, Martin Beheim, working in Nuremberg, his native town, made his famous globe, mockingly called the potato. Beheim was a craftsman and later traveled to Portugal. 
He's supposed to have sailed on a number of Portuguese expeditions, even on the famous voyage commanded by Diego Cao. He later became a cosmographer in the service of King John II of Portugal. In this job, he acquired a very detailed knowledge of the appearance of the world. The fact that he built a globe in 1492 goes to show that even in the late Middle Ages, the Earth was certainly believed to be a sphere. Possibly Columbus knows of this globe. In any case, he proceeds on the assumption that the Earth is round. But scholars argue about how big the Earth is, because the size of the circumference will determine whether a ship can sail from Europe to India. The voyage must not last longer than 40 days, for by then, at the latest, all provisions will have been eaten and fresh water become undrinkable. Yet alongside the sober view of the world held by merchants and seafarers, there is also still a picture of the world seen on strictly Christian terms. At the center of this world lies the holy city of Jerusalem. According to Christian cosmology, everything revolves around the world that God has created. Faith alone determines how this world is to be perceived and faith lays down as well how the maps are to be drawn. In medieval maps of the world, Jerusalem, of course, lies at the center. Auch in einem größeren Zusammenhang erwies sich die Lehre der Kirche als sehr zählebig und hartnäckig und gegen alle Even in the wider world, the teaching of the church proved to be very stubborn and unyielding in the face of all scientific knowledge. In the 16th century, Copernicus achieved a breakthrough when he declared the sun to be at the center of the planetary system. A move away from the geocentric viewpoint where the Earth is at the center. Nevertheless, almost a hundred years later, the famous Tuscan scholar Galileo Galilei was forced by the Church to stand trial, to recant, and scandalously to more or less declare the heliocentric system a heresy. The Church continued to hold to its view for a long time, and the defender of the heliocentric system, Galileo Galilei, was only rehabilitated in 1992. Galileo Galilei stands before the Church's dreaded doctrinal court, the Inquisition. Heresy is a serious charge. In the eyes of the Church, it can lead to damnation. Yet all he has said is that the Earth revolves around the Sun. For Galileo, the man of science, this statement could mean his death. The Church refuses to accept the truth of Galileo's observations. It sees its power being threatened. The Church cannot accept that the Earth, God's creation, is only a small planet revolving around the mighty Sun. Against his better understanding, the celebrated scientist is to confess his error as the church sees it and repudiate his discoveries. The trial opens up a deep rift between the church and science. The threats of the Inquisition are so intimidating that despite himself, Galileo acknowledges the church's worldview. The planets revolve around the earth. His supposed words, but it does move, are an invention of the 17th century. The discoveries made on the other side of the oceans worry the church. Scientists and sailors encounter peoples, animals and plants unmentioned in the Bible. But even for America, hitherto completely unknown, the church comes up with an explanation. After God created the old world, he made the new world, which must now be colonized in the name of Christ. After the discovery of America, events proceed at a breathtaking pace. The European invaders find gold in quantities beyond their wildest dreams. With the gold of the Incas, impoverished Spain grows into a wealthy colonial power. The amount of gold brought to Europe is so huge that it causes inflation. The gold makes a few people rich and many poor. 
the conquistadores exercise a destructive dominion over the indigenous peoples of America. Spanish law dictates that the Indios must work for 18 months in the gold and silver mines. Broken by hard labor and ravaged by infectious diseases imported by the Europeans, the natives die like flies. The Indios are not only robbed by the Christians, they are also forced to pray to the Christian God and enslaved. For without slavery, the wealth of America cannot be fully exploited. Crossing the equator is the death of all moral precepts, states an 18th century English politician. The first American to discover Columbus made an unhappy discovery, asserts a European philosopher in the same century. The European voyages of discovery reach farther and farther. Their goals are more clearly defined. The seafarers conquer the new worlds with ever bigger ships and equipped with ever more accurate charts. As well as the Spaniards and the Portuguese, now the ships of the French and the English are constantly plying the seas in search of their share of the legendary riches of India, Africa and the Americas. And now the search expands into the southern hemisphere, to the great continent of Terra Australis. After 300 years of exploration, geographical information is so extensive and the nautical charts so accurate that a new epoch begins, the Second Age of Discovery. A new Entdeckungszeitalter, the Second in the second half of the 18th century, Europeans embark on a new age of discovery. In my opinion, there are two main motives. One is the European vision of Terra Australis, a vast and fantastically embellished southern continent, supposed to be a kind of counterpart to the land masses of the northern hemisphere. The second motive was the colonial and maritime rivalry between the British and the French in the second half of the 18th century. This resulted in both nations fiercely competing for victory by being the first to discover Terra Australis. In 1766, under a French commission, Antine sailed to the South Seas and took possession of Tahiti, which is still a French colony today. In 1768, he was followed by James Cook, acting under the instructions of the British Royal Geographic Society. On this first voyage, he was the first to chart New Zealand, but did not land. In 1769 and 1770, Cook became the first to discover those areas of Australia that were later settled by European colonists. Two further great voyages followed, on the second of which Cook was killed on Hawaii. The second age of discovery differs fundamentally from the first in that the European nations were now competing with each other on a truly systematic scale. They were scientifically prepared and equipped, and both Cook and Bougainville and others were accompanied by a host of scientists and experts who surveyed, charted, collected zoological and botanical specimens and studied the languages of the indigenous peoples they encountered. Above all, James Cook makes maps and charts of all the newly discovered islands. In this way, he records that these territories are now possessions of the British crown. For years, he voyages in the unknown southern hemisphere. For almost three years, he sails across the Pacific Ocean. His search for Terra Australis becomes desperate. He discovers and surveys 3,000 kilometers of an unknown coastline, and then sails so far north towards the Arctic Circle 
that his progress is only halted when his ships encounter a solid wall of ice. James Cook coaxes and bullies his men into eating sauerkraut. Rich in vitamin C, this vegetable prevents the terrible disease of scurvy. Cook's voyages of discovery are also voyages of scientific research. Among the basic equipment of Cook's ships are provisions for the crew, sextant and compass for navigation, and a team of naturalists who observe, sketch and describe every new thing they come across. James Cook's voyages confirmed what was already known. They didn't add much that was truly new. The Earth was round. It could be circumnavigated by ship. But Cook's travels reassured those who had previously believed that anyone crossing the equator would melt or go up in flames, or that anyone sailing the Southern Ocean would freeze solid. These voyages also established the existence of a southern continent, which turned out to be very different from what had been expected. And there was a second consequence, namely, that the power of the British Empire now extended around the globe, reaching not just North America and parts of Africa, but truly covering the world. Twice more, James Cook sets sail for the Pacific. Again, the voyages last for years. The European seafarers learn about the maritime world of the Polynesians. They call themselves they who sail long distances. Over an ocean as vast as the surface of the moon, they sail confidently from island to island, navigating solely by the stars. The charts of their sea routes, extending over thousands of kilometers, are in their heads. They know nothing of drawn maps. In the constantly wet conditions of the small boats, such charts wouldn't last long anyway. Only rarely do the Polynesians use braided navigational aids. Scientists can only guess what the sticks and shells might mean. To the Polynesians, they indicate currents and hazards around the islands that Cook is laboriously surveying. James Cook has a much more accurate picture of the world than Columbus and his contemporaries, who had neither telescopes nor a realistic idea of the size of the Earth. The ship's compass becomes an increasingly accurate instrument. Fixing one's position at sea, of vital importance where everything looks the same, becomes almost as easy as on land. The Industrial Revolution, with its steam engines and a never-ending stream of technical inventions, gives Europe and its shipping a technological advantage from which it will profit well into the 20th century. But just as in previous centuries, maps and charts of newly discovered seas and continents are closely guarded secrets. Maps mean economic power, and that means they are often stolen or deliberately forged in order to lure political rivals onto the rocks, as it were. In every high culture, maps are a valuable asset. Only kings and their ministers may hold the world in their hands. For whoever possesses the maps knows the routes to the riches of the earth. For by now, those routes have been almost completely surveyed. All the more important, then, is the need to explore the white patches remaining in the picture of the world. The white patches marking the interior of Asia and Africa attract scientists, traders and adventurers. 
They have all heard of the caravan routes and oases. They all wish to discover sunken cities and fairy tale treasures. They are fascinated by fabulous stories reaching Europe from all corners of the globe. They tell of the source of the Blue Nile, of exotic peoples and strange cultures. And they dream of fantastic wealth. And for this, they risk life and limb on tortuous journeys with no certain outcome. And because they write everything down and make detailed sketches, they are often thought to be spies. So, they travel in disguise, like the German explorer Karsten Niebuhr. Commissioned by the King of Denmark, he travels around on the Arabian Peninsula. His orders are to study the geography and biology of this unknown land. From Arabia, Niebuhr travels to India. He sketches along the Euphrates and discovers the site of the biblical Babylon. Dressed as a Muslim, he is the first European to reach the holy places of Islam. For seven years, Niebuhr remains in Arabia. He is the first to describe and map the Arabian lands. From Niebuhr, Europeans first receive accurate information about the size of Arabia and its culture. The great journeys of discovery had revealed the world as a whole, but there were still many white patches remaining. And it was not only scientists who now set out, but also adventurers like Cecil Rhodes or Livingstone, in search of the source of the Nile, attempting to travel across Arabia or to reach the North or South Pole. Information and knowledge resulted in ever more detailed maps of the world. And in this way, the number and range of human cultures were also revealed, as were the seemingly infinite variety of languages spoken throughout the world. Humanity was seen as a whole in all its diverse cultural expressions. An image was made of which, today, we are the inheritors. For a picture of the world that is this accurate, there are people prepared to pay good money. In 1850, an international expedition, financed by the English, sets out across the Sahara. The purpose? To open up new trade routes. The expedition's leader is the German geographer Heinrich Barth. Wherever he travels, Barth gathers information about the land and its people. In order not to be treated as a foreigner, Bart dresses as a Muslim. Unrecognized as a spy, he makes detailed drawings of his journey. Setting off from Tripoli, he crosses the desert and becomes the first European to reach the legendary trading city of Timbuktu on the river Niger. Heinrich Bart calculates the distance he has covered. This is the basis for the first accurate map of the desert. He has traveled 20,000 kilometers. Now, after a journey lasting five years and five months, for Europeans, the Sahara is no longer a white patch on the map. Maps represent a victory over conquered territories that can be held in the hands. What it is like in the colonies, Europeans learn from stories and descriptions. But where in the world the colonies are can only be learned from maps and atlases. On paper, people can trace the routes from London to India to Arabia and into the heart of Africa. From Paris, they can search out Egypt and the Nile Delta. From Madrid, they can follow the long seaway over the Atlantic to South America. Fully equipped, millions of Europeans now pour over the conquered continents, and European cartographers 
are now drawing the face of the world. One of the most significant cartographers is Lawrence of Arabia. England wishes to extend her power in Egypt. For this, accurate maps of the country are needed. Lawrence comes to Egypt as an officer in the intelligence services. In the field, the spies employ an old ruse. They disguise themselves as scientific explorers and go to work. They make maps of the Middle East and divide it up. This is how Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine and Arabia come into existence. The borders of these new states are completely arbitrary. Cartographers' lines drawn on the map. Armed revolts by the Arabs against the new regime are doomed to failure. Not only do the British possess superior weaponry, their extensive maps of the region allow them to plan military actions with great precision. Egypt and the Near East are now administered by Great Britain and France. Today, national borders in North Africa and Arabia still look as though they were drawn with a ruler, which they were, almost a hundred years ago, by politicians and cartographers. Human beings began looking at their world thousands of years ago by looking up at the stars. The constellations enabled people to find their way around their planet. Guided by the stars, they embarked on the first great voyages over the oceans and conquered new worlds. They travel without navigational instruments, without sea charts, always following the winds and the currents the true face of the world remains hidden from them. Sea charts and the compass are creations of the modern age. Centuries pass before they have developed into reliable instruments of navigation. The first accurate pictures of the world are drawn at sea. Mariners survey the coastlines and cartographers set down the information on paper. Maps too gradually become more reliable and ships find their way more easily over the seas. Today, ships navigate by computer. To fix his position, a captain now needs neither compass nor chart. The ship's course is plotted on the screen. The computer has replaced the chart. <laughs>